Today I want to talk about something that probably everyone in this room has experienced at one point or another, and that is food cravings. This is a topic that I think is really important because it has such a profound impact on our eating behavior and ultimately our waistlines and our health. I also think it's a really good illustration of how we can bring together modern neuroscience with an evolutionary perspective to gain insights into ourselves, insights into how we tick. So here's what we're going to talk about today. First, I'm going to define what a craving is. Then I'm going to talk about how cravings arise, what's the mechanism. Then I'm going to talk about which foods trigger cravings the most, so sort of a brief literature review on that. And then I'm going to give you some broad principles on how to manage cravings. So what is a craving? I'm going to show you a series of images in two groups, five images per group. And I want you to pay close attention to how you feel as you're looking at these images. So really pay attention to how you feel as you see these images. First group, spinach. Boiled potatoes, cucumbers, apple, broccoli. That's the first set of images. Now I'm going to show you a second set of images. And again, pay attention to how you feel as you're looking at these. Hamburger and fries, brownies. Chocolate, pastries, and chips. So did you notice anything different when you were looking at these two sets of images? It felt different to look at them, didn't it? If you're like most people, you probably didn't feel much when you were looking at the first set of images. But as you were looking at the second set, you may have felt a feeling of desire welling up inside of you, at least for certain of those images. Um, you may have felt, you may have salivated a little bit. You may have felt uh, a little hunger pang developing. And this is the experience of a craving. But how exactly do we define that term? Craving is a state of heightened eating motivation that is directed at a specific food. So it's not the same as hunger which is a non-specific motivation toward calorie-containing food in general. So it's a motivational state toward a specific food. Um, and there's another thing I want to explain about cravings that I think is really important, and that's that we don't control cravings. Cravings are something that arise from the non-conscious brain and that we experience, but that we're not in control over we're not in control of. So we can control our behavior in response to cravings, but we can't control when or how we experience that state. So how does this happen? What's the mechanism? Well, to begin to answer this question, and since this is the Ancestral Health Symposium, I'm going to take an evolutionary perspective on this. So let's say you're an engineer by the name of Nat RL Selection, and you're trying to design an organism that's able to survive and thrive on the African savanna. You know a few things to start off with. You know that energy is critical for survival and reproduction. So your organism is going to have to be efficient at obtaining energy. Second, you know that the primary forms of available energy are carbohydrate, fat, and protein if you're an animal and not a plant. So you have to design your organism to have an intrinsic hardwired motivation to seek and consume carbohydrate, fat, and protein to fuel itself. But it's not always obvious on the surface which foods contain carbohydrate, fat, and protein. So you also have to wire your organism to be able to learn through experience which foods supply those substances. And furthermore, your organism has to be able to tune its motivational level to match the value of the item. 
So it's worthwhile perhaps to hunt an antelope for three days, but it's not worthwhile to go on a foraging expedition for three days for a handful of berries. So the organism has to be able to match the motivational level to the value of the food item. And what I'm going to show you in this talk is that roughly speaking, this is how humans are wired. And this is how it works. When we eat food, that food enters our digestive tract, goes into the stomach, and then to the small intestine. And the small intestine contains receptors for a great number of things in our food, but the ones that we're interested in today are sugar, starch, fat, protein, salt, and glutamate. So these receptors are specifically detecting sugar, starch, fat, protein, salt, glutamate. In fact, detecting starch indirectly by the glucose that's, that's generated during digestion. Um, glutamate is that meaty umami flavor that's in bone broth and soy sauce and monosodium glutamate. And once it detects those things, it sends a signal to the brain that informs the brain of what you've just eaten. So it tells the brain what you've eaten and what the concentration is of those different substances in your food. So what happens once it gets there? We, we don't actually know how that signal gets to the brain yet, but we do know once it gets to the brain, it activates a brain region called the ventral tegmental area. And this is one of the key dopamine producing areas of the brain. And this is really, um, the, the primary area that produces the dopamine that motivates us and that causes our cravings. So the ventral tegmental area, um, once it starts producing dopamine, that dopamine goes primarily to a region called the ventral striatum, also known as the nucleus accumbens. And the ventral striatum is really intimately involved in generating motivational states, basic motivational states and cravings, which are a type of motivational state. So whether it's sex or drugs or gambling or food or whatever the motivational state is, whatever the craving is, the ventral striatum is gonna be involved in that. So dopamine starts to spike in the ventral striatum and the more concentrated those nutrients are that we saw in the last slide, the higher the level of dopamine you're gonna get in your ventral striatum and the more pronounced the motivational state. So this is just another way of showing the same thing. We have the ventral striatum illustrated on the brain, and then below we just have a synapse with some dopamine coming out of it. Um, so what happens when that, when that dopamine starts to spike in your ventral striatum? Well, it does a couple of things. The first thing it does is it creates a motivational state, it creates and, and accentuates the motivational state to keep doing the thing that you're doing as the dopamine spiking. So if you're eating that pizza, you're going to be really into eating more of that pizza and perhaps having another slice or three. Um, but the second thing it does is even more important. It causes you to learn. And to explain how this happens, I'm going to go back to a key experiment that many of you are probably familiar with that was performed by Ivan Pavlov in dogs. So dogs, when they see a food, especially a food they really, really like, they start to salivate and they get really excited, right? So food activates a motivational and a digestive preparatory state in dogs that causes them, that motivates them to obtain and eat the food and prepares their body for digesting it. However, if you ring a bell around a dog, it doesn't really mean anything to it. That's a, a meaningless sensory stimulus. So what Pavlov did was he showed that if he consistently rang a bell at the same time as he fed the dogs, he did this over and over again so that the dogs came to associate the sound of the bell with the food, and that bell became a reliable predictor of the food. After that training, he could ring the bell by itself, and it would activate that same excitement and that same salivation that he saw toward food initially. So the dogs learned that this sensory stimulus predicted food, and it activated a motivational and digestive state. 
And this is basically how it works in humans as well. So when that dopamine starts to spike, your brain starts to really pay attention to what's going on in your surroundings. It n notes very carefully, and this is all on a non-conscious level, it notes the smells that are happening, the tastes that are happening, the texture of the food. It notes the appearance of the food, the triangular shape of the slices and the round pepperonis and the box it came out of. It notes the location where you ate it, who you were with, what the situation was, and those sensory stimuli become motivational triggers the next time you experience them. So just like Pavlov's dogs learn to be motivated by the ringing of the bell, which initially was a meaningless sensory stimulus, we learn to become motivated by these sensory stimuli that are associated with the foods that we're eating. And so the next time you smell that smell, the next time you go to a place where you've eaten pizza before, et cetera, it gets your dopamine spiking again and it activates that motivational state. In other words, it causes a craving. And so uh, the more concentrated are these nutrients here in your food, the higher your dopamine is going to go and the more it's going to drive this eating reinforcement craving cycle. And this is really, I think, a uh, major driver of our eating behavior, or at least of many people's eating behavior in the modern world. But one thing I want to emphasize about this that I think is really important is that this happens for all foods, not just junk foods. This happens for apples, this happens for salmon, this happens for uh, collard greens with you know, salt and oil. This happens for everything. But certain foods, by virtue of their physical and chemical properties, drive this cycle more than others. And a lot of our modern foods basically drive it too hard and motivate us too much to, to eat them. And that can drive um, consumption of unhealthy food and overconsumption of food. So this system is not broken in the modern world. It's doing exactly what it was designed to do. The problem is we're giving the system the wrong cues through the foods that we're eating, which are too calorie dense, too refined, and too hyper palatable, um, and as well as having a food environment that's constantly feeding the system cues that are spiking our dopamine and spiking our motivation, food cues like images of food on TV, smells of food as you're walking down the street, etc. All right, so now I want to show you uh, a little bit about how this works in real life. As I was doing the research for my book, I had the good fortune of being able to participate in uh, an fMRI experiment. So this is functional MRI. Basically, it's a non-invasive way of looking inside your brain and seeing what parts of your brain are being activated. And so I'm laying in this fMRI machine with a, uh, an inflatable cap around my head to really hold my head still. And I'm looking at images of food on a screen. So I'm perceiving sensory stimuli that are reminding my brain of food on a screen. And there's three different types of images I'm looking at. I'm looking at, and they're, they're all mixed together randomly. I'm looking at images of calorie dense, highly palatable foods, things like um, pastries, pizza, potato chips. I'm looking at low calorie healthy foods like strawberries, celery, and apples. And I'm also looking at non-food items like shoes and cars. And basically we're using those because there's a certain brain activity that happens when you're just looking at images in general. And so you can use that data to kind of divide out all the noise that's happening when you're just looking at something and specifically look at the brain activity that's happening when you're looking at food. And so here's an image of what was going on in my brain when I was looking at the junk food. And this is illustrating my brain at the level of the ventral tegmental area. Again, this is a part of your brain that makes that dopamine that's really involved in motivating you to eat food. Um, there's another thing I want to mention about this before we proceed, and that is that I skipped two meals and rode my bike to the medical center for this experiment. So I, I wanted to put my brain in a really, in an energy depleted state so that it would respond especially strongly to 
Um, and so as you can see in this image, uh, where the arrow is pointing, that's my ventral tegmental area. If you look at the scale bar on the top, you can see that my VTA is, is quite strongly activated, as well as some associated regions in the, in the forebrain that it projects to. In contrast, when I was looking at the healthy food, there was a lot less activation. And um, actually, that, that little dot there is not quite in the right place. It's a little, little too far um, down. So I'm not sure that's even the VTA. So my brain clearly was not as interested in, uh, in the healthy food. And that was even more pronounced when we looked at my ventral striatum, also known as nucleus accumbens. So, and these, by the way, these are really small brain regions. So you, you shouldn't expect to see like a big blob. Um, but what you should look at is the level of activation. And again, if you look at the scale bar, my ventral striatum was on fire when I was looking at that junk food. And also, again, um, associated forebrain structures. In contrast, when I was looking at the healthy food, there was not a whole lot going on. You can see there's no activity whatsoever in my ventral striatum. And this is actually typical of the studies that are done by my colleague, Ellen Schur, who um, helped me with this experiment. Um, we, our brains respond more to foods that are more calorie dense, that are higher in these substances that I was talking about, and particularly when we're in an energy depleted state. So when you're hungry, when your brain perceives that you're in an energy depleted state, it doesn't want to eat low calorie foods. It's not that interested in low calorie foods. It wants to eat something really calorie dense that's going to efficiently uh, replete your your energy stores. And you know, one, one thing I want to add that I forgot to mention in the earlier slides, those substances that I was talking about that motivate us, that the brain really pays attention to, every single one of those is a form of carbohydrate, fat, or protein, except salt. That's the only exception on that list. So the brain is very, very attuned to substances that are delivering calories to the body presumably because of the evolutionary context where calories were a really important driver of natural selection um, and reproductive success. Okay, so what I've just shown you is that humans do have an intrinsic motivation for carbohydrate, fat, and protein. We have the ability to learn which foods supply them through dopamine-mediated reinforcement. And we have the ability to tune our motivation level to match the value of the item because the amount of dopamine that's released is proportional to the concentration of those nutrients that are being detected in the gut. So this satisfies all the criteria we were uh, proposing earlier. So now let's move on to the second section and look at which foods trigger cravings the most. So we're all good scientists here, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do a little bit of scientific method here. And um, so we have our hypothesis. I laid out my hypothesis in the previous section. So now I'm going to try to test that. And the way you test a hypothesis is you make predictions based on it, and then you see if the evidence corresponds to those predictions. So here are my predictions. I predict that foods that trigger the most dopamine release should trigger cravings the most. Those are foods that are concentrated in sugar, starch, fat, protein, salt, and glutamate. And particularly that these things should trigger cravings when they're combined. So when multiple reward buttons are being pushed by the same food, that should trigger cravings even more. So what I've done is I've done a little brief literature review, and I've looked up papers that are relevant to this question in humans. And there are a few different ways we can look at this. But the two primary ways are, one, you just ask people, what are the foods that you crave the most? And then you rank them. And the second one is you can look at addiction-like behaviors, which addiction is very similar to craving. The mechanism is, is basically the same, or very similar. Um, and you can say which foods are driving your addiction-like behaviors. And then there's a third way I'm going to throw in that's a lot more indirect, and that is just saying, what do people eat in the modern United States? 
what's the average diet like and how well does that match up to the predictions that we might make based on the things that spike dopamine. So in the first study, researchers asked 1,000 male and female college students what their most intensely craved foods were. And this is a ranked list here. We can see that uh, number one is chocolate. That's a pretty consistent finding. Then we have pizza. Then we have chips, popcorn, and pretzels, ice cream, sweets other than ice cream. And then at the bottom, not craved as often, we have meat and chicken and bread as, and, and pasta. So there are a couple of things that are interesting about this. First of all, I think this is pretty consistent with the predictions overall. At the top of the list, we have foods that are very, very calorie dense and are combinations of strong uh, reward factors, those substances that we were looking at earlier. But there's another thing that I think is really interesting about this study, and that is that we can look at sex differences. So, uh, as you can see, women in particular were drawn toward chocolate. And this is kind of a stereotype, but it's actually true. There are a number of studies that have found this. Uh, chocolate is very popular among men as well, but not quite as popular as among women. And actually, if you go down that list, you can see that for all of the sweet foods, women crave them more often than men. And furthermore, um, if you look at the kind of savory, fatty, salty foods like pizza and meat, those were craved more often by men than by women. So there may be some sex differences in uh, cravings. For the second study, researchers interviewed 108 healthy American women, so this is specific to women, about their food cravings and ranked them according to the most craved foods. And this is the top 10 here. Uh, again, number one is chocolate, pretty consistent finding. Number two is cookies, cakes, and pastries, so far pretty consistent. Um, fresh fruit, that's not really what the hypothesis would predict. That's not a very calorie-dense food. It's not a mixture of different reward factors. It pretty much only has sugar. Um, ice cream, Chinese food, chips, popcorn, seafood, beef, lamb, and veal, dark green vegetables, and nuts. So this is kind of interesting because it's a mix, I would say, of things that the hypothesis would predict and a, thing, a mix of things that it wouldn't predict. Um, and the fresh fruit one really stands out to me because that's number three on the list. That's really high up there. And that's not an especially energy dense food. And I'll be honest with you, I don't really know how to explain that. But um, what I will say is that it's not something that has been replicated in a lot of other studies. So fresh fruit is not, in other studies, doesn't seem to come up very often as a commonly craved food. I'm going to show you one example of that here. Um, so this study was conducted by Ashley Gearhart, who's uh, really a pioneer in the field of food addiction. And I, I'm going to call it addiction-like behavior or put the word addiction in quotes to recognize the fact that there's still uh, ongoing scientific debate about whether foods are truly addictive or whether they just create behaviors that look a lot like addiction to drugs or whatever. So just to recognize that, that debate. Um, but the thing that I think is really cool about this study is that Gearhart and her colleagues gave people a list of 35 common foods and act, asked them to rank them from top to bottom in terms of how much they triggered addiction-like behaviors. And the thing that's really cool about this is that we can look not only at the top of the list, but we can look at the bottom of the list. And we can say, what are the least craved foods? And so what I've done here is I've copied and pasted the top 10 on the left and the bottom 10 on the right out of the total of 35. And so again, chocolate's number one, no surprise there. This is, by the way, this is men and women together. Um, ice cream, french fries, pizzas, cookies, chips, cake, buttered popcorn, cheeseburgers, and muffins. This to me is, is just exactly what the hypothesis predicts. These are all extremely calorie dense combinations of concentrated rewarding nutrients that we saw in, in the earlier slide. Now if we look at the least craved foods, we have 
apples and bananas, so that's two fresh fruit. Um, so that doesn't correspond to what we saw in the last slide. Um, we have plain corn, salmon, plain carrots, plain brown rice, water, plain cucumber, broccoli, and plain beans. So there are a couple of interesting things about this that I want to point out. First of all, you know, obviously this is consistent with the hypothesis, but the second thing I want to point out is those foods on the right, you could make a healthy diet out of that. I mean, those foods are a lot better for you than the ones on the left. If, if, if the entire American population only ate foods selected from the right, they'd probably be a lot healthier than they are today. But those are not the foods that our brains are that interested in. Our brains are a lot more interested in the foods on the left, at least on an instinctive uh, craving level. So the, uh, the way our brains are wired to respond to these specific nutrients worked really well for our ancestors, but it doesn't work that great in the modern environment where the foods on the left are very easy to acquire. So the final study I'm going to show you is another study on addiction-like behavior. Researchers administered questionnaires to 1,495 Dutch college students asking about symptoms of food addiction and which types of foods were, drove those symptoms the most. And then they broke it down into four categories. So high fat savory, this is things like chips and fries and meat and cheese. High fat sweet, which is things like cake and chocolate and pastries. Uh, low fat sweet or mainly sugar, this is things like hard candy, soda and dried fruit. And low fat savory, which is things like rice cakes, crackers, vegetables and bread. And what you can see is that by far the most uh, commonly reported cravings were for the high fat savory and the high fat sweet categories. So again, these are mixtures of concentrated rewarding nutrients. There were many fewer people reporting cravings for uh, foods that were primarily sugar and foods that were um, primarily uh, low fat savory like bread and that sort of thing. So people did report, sorry I shouldn't say cravings, addiction-like behaviors. So people did report addiction-like behaviors to the mainly sugar and low-fat savory categories, but it was a lot less common. And so I think this is also very consistent with the hypothesis that these uh, calorie-dense mixtures of these nutrients are the things that trigger the cravings and the addiction-like behavior the most strongly. So the last source of data I'm going to consider is simply survey data on, or I should say questionnaire data, on the diet, the typical diet of the U.S. population. So th these are uh, data from uh, the USDA Dietary Guidelines for Americans report. These are as of 2006. This is pretty credible data. Um, and they have these ranked in the order of greatest to least calorie contributions in the American diet. This is the top 10. So these are the top 10 foods that our Americans are getting their calories from. Number one, grain-based desserts. So this is things like pastries and cookies and cake. I kid you not, that is the number one source of calories in the U.S. diet. It's really pretty shocking. Um, yeast breads. Bread is actually quite calorie dense. We don't think about it that way because it's full of air. But when you chew it, the air goes away, and it's very, very dense in carbohydrate. A lot of people also don't know this, but it's the primary source of salt in the American diet. Um, chicken and chicken mixed dishes, that includes fried chicken. Soda energy sports drinks, in other words, sugar water. Pizza, booze, pasta, tortillas, burritos, tacos, beef and beef mix mixed dishes, and dairy desserts, in other words, ice cream. So, you know, not all of these foods, I would say, correspond exactly to what the hypothesis predicts. But you have to consider that the brain doesn't just respond to dopamine. The brain responds to a lot of different incentives, and some of those are things like cost and convenience. So we wouldn't expect our diets to only be driven by dopamine reinforcement. 
However, I think given that, this list is actually quite consistent with dopamine playing a very uh, key role in our behavior. So just to review this section, characteristics of food that commonly trigger craving and addiction-like behavior are mixers of concentrated starch, sugar, fat, protein, salt, and glutamate. Um, and the most commonly craved foods are fatty and sweet foods or fatty and savory foods such as cookies, chocolate, cake, pastries, and ice cream, and pizza, fried chicken, cheese, and chips. Low-fat, savory, and sweet foods are less common but still craved, such as bread and crackers and hard candy and soda. And so I think this is very consistent with the hypothesis that our food choices are guided in large part by dopamine release in the brain. And this is a, a picture of the chemical structure of dopamine. And the reason that our brains and our bodies are set up this way is that dopamine is responding to the food properties that kept our ancestors alive and fertile. Now I want to give a couple of brief tips on how to manage cravings. So if you're trying to quit smoking, you don't leave packs of cigarettes laying around, you don't go to smoky bars, you don't hang around with your friends who smoke, you don't expose yourself to those cues. These are cues that get your dopamine spiking and trigger cravings that can be hard to control. So the first step is to limit your cue exposure. And there are a lot of places cues can come from. Um, the food industry uses cues to try to ring Pavlov's bell and stimulate our motivation to purchase their foods. So avoiding food cues on television and things like that is helpful. Um, and also controlling your food environment at home and at work. So we do it to ourselves by exposing ourselves to food cues in our own kitchens and at our work. So you don't want to expose yourself to the sight or the sound or sight or the smell or other cues associated with food, especially foods that are tempting. The second major principle is to focus on simple, unrefined foods. Things like fruits, meats, vegetables, oatmeal, yogurt, potatoes, and sweet potatoes don't have the real high concentration of those nutrients that spike your dopamine, and they're not gonna, they're gonna be less likely to drive your motivation to an excessive level. So just eat simple, unrefined foods. And one last tip I'll give you is that just like we forget all kinds of things in our lives, we forget, you know, we learn all the state capitals in middle school and we gradually forget those. We forget the 10th digit of pi, but um, the non-conscious parts of the brain also forget. And so those reward associations that you've formed if you don't continue to reinforce those by continuing to, eating, continuing to eat those foods, they will gradually fade over time and have less and less power over you. So the take home points for the talk are most food cravings are simply dopamine reinforced motivations. Concentrated sugar, starch, fat, protein, salt, and glutamate create and maintain cravings. The most commonly craved foods are fa fatty and savory like chips or fatty and sweet like chocolate. And to manage cravings, limit your exposure to food cues and focus on simple, unrefined foods. I'd like to thank a few people who played key roles in this talk. Some people who did research that um, made large contributions to this are Anthony Scalfani, Ivan De Araujo, Wolfram Schultz, and Ellen Schur. Shizuka Aoki was the illustrator who I hired to do illustrations for my book. Um, I showed one of her illustrations earlier in the talk. Ellen Schur, Susan Melhorn, Mary Askren, and the University of Washington Diagnostic Imaging Sciences Center was kind enough to uh, do that fMRI experiment on me. And if you enjoyed this talk and you want to see more of my work, you can go to stephanguiane.com. Thank you. Aaron? <laughs> Stefan, excellent summary and review of what we know uh, about the brain mechanisms 
that underlie our cravings. Being uh, an expert in the field of Pavlovian learning and those areas, one thing I also know is that it's really hard. Once you acquire these associations, it's really hard to extinguish them. And they can persist for years. So the forgetting point that you mentioned is good. But one thing I want to maybe also raise is that the idea that maybe once a week, once a month, you know, those of us on trying to follow a whole foods paleo template type of diet say, okay, we're going to have that what some people call a cheat day or I'm going to, you know, relax and have something I normally don't have. Those intermittent pairings can reactivate an old forgotten memory or even an extinguished association and re uh, and it can come back full strength. And so I just want everybody to realize that it could be very a very nefarious problem to try and really rid yourselves of the cravings you've acquired for these hyper palatable foods. Yeah, thanks for that, Aaron. Thanks for adding that. Um, and yeah, it's really interesting and it, it raises a tough dilemma because, you know, at least from my perspective, I don't I don't really want to be a drill sergeant with people. I don't want to tell people don't ever eat, you know, a slice of pizza. Don't ever eat a brownie. I want people to have a healthy relationship with food where they could eat it every now and then. But I mean, what you're saying is absolutely right. Um, and I, I think that's absolutely right. And in fact, I have a little anecdote um, about this. Those of you who have kids have probably experienced things like this, but I have a friend who, uh, who has a son. He's very young. He's like, uh, one and a half maybe and they were trying to raise him on a healthy diet so they hadn't exposed him to a lot of unhealthy calorie dense foods like cake and, and stuff like that and while they were away on vacation my friend's uh, dad was taking care of the child and gave him a little piece of a donut just a little piece like really a little piece and the kid would not stop talking about it every day it was donut 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 and, uh, and whenever my friend would have a bagel, the kid thought it was a donut. <laughs> and so, yeah, those things, they really make an impression on the brain. It's very powerful. Yeah, I hope that you include that part in the future, talking about this, because I think that's a real issue that we need to continue to get out there. But thanks. Hi. Hey, Aaron, that's a fantastic point, because when you're counseling people on nutrition, Getting that through their heads, like cheating is just shooting yourself in the foot is hard. So getting out, figuring out how to convey the message in a way that any old anybody could get would be nice. Just want to ask you a quick question about the possibility of dopamine making fasting difficult, and if there's any research on if you could do dopotrophic supplements or anything to make fasting easier. Uh, that's not something that I know anything about, honestly. Sorry. Hopefully somebody will study that. <laughs> so I think there's a big difference in how easily people get addicted to things in general and how, um, how easily or their tendency to crave things. For example, I personally and my father don't really get addicted very easily or crave things. And I wondered if you think that a valid hypothesis might be that for people like me or for my, for my dad would be maybe that our dopamine response is limited, possibly. We just don't maybe have a quick dopamine response, maybe a little bit when we see a brownie but on a screen, but not so much. I mean, yeah, first, I mean sorry. Oh, well, I was in a hospital done. last year in a car accident. I got some heavy duty medicine they were afraid to prescribe and my dad also had an experience similar where um the drugs they gave him were you know the type of thing they were very controlled and for both of us it was very easy to stop it was not an issue at all and and i talked to another doctor who was kind of amazed that i was able to stop as soon as the pain was gone yeah i was done no need so uh Essentially, there is individual variability in any, almost any aspect of the dopamine and motivation system that you care to look at, and a lot of it's genetic. So, right. as you said, there's, very, there's major individual differences in how likely people are to become addicted. 
in general and even mm. to how likely they are to become addicted to specific things. Um, oh, mm -hmm. So, and a lot of that is genetic. There's probably some that's not genetic as well, but there's a very strong genetic component to it. And this is actually something I talk about in my book as well. Okay. You can actually, and we, and we don't, by the way, we don't really know a lot about what the specific brain mechanisms are that are mediating that. Okay. But, but we do know that there is a very strong genetic component to it. And would you say that the addiction and the craving aspect are, are related? For example, I'm not someone who craves chocolate. I, I, I get hungry, yeah, but you know, I don't crave things. Yeah, so. I mean, we put labels on motivation and we call it different things in different contexts and when it has different levels of strength, but it's all very similar process. Okay. So there's a continuum from not caring about something to being totally and utterly addicted to it. Right. And that continuum includes, uh, you know, healthy relationship. It includes not caring, healthy right. relationship with it, right. uh, craving it too much, being addicted, being yeah. super addicted. Okay. It's all the same process. It's just different levels of dopamine and different levels of your ability to deal with that dopamine-mediated right. reinforcement. But it all comes down to dopamine. Dopamine is, is the essential... Um, mediator there that would determine how much you you either crave or are addicted to something. Yeah, I don't want to say it's only dopamine, okay, but yeah. I want to say that dopamine is a very, very important element oh. of it. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. I appreciate so much of this, especially the variety of data sources that you used and how you analyzed them and your willingness to state your hypothesis before looking at them. Um, and, but my favorite thing, I think, was the distinction you made between uh, motivation that's hunger-related and motivation that's not. And it, what the first thought I had about that was that this might signal uh, or indicate the rarity of the availability of different foods while we were evolving and the idea that Aaron brought up with intermittent rewards makes a lot of sense there too. Um, but what I was wondering is if, um, what also struck me was things that are motivated by hunger also seem to be demotivated by satiety that comes into play, whereas the foods that you're, that you're identifying as highly crave sensitive don't seem to have that satiety setting in. Can you speak to that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, there, there are many additional levels of complexity that we could add to this system to that would be required to explain, you know, human eating behavior in real life. But I think the certainly the uh, uh, hunger or energy homeostasis system is a big part of that, and so and that has very strong interactions with the reward or craving system that I was talking about in this talk. So um, if you are, if your brain does not perceive that you have an energy need, so you're satiated, then you're not going to be that interested in your average food that you might be interested in if you were hungry. So something, you know, like a, a piece of plain meat or a boiled potato or unsalted nuts or something like that, you're probably not going to be that interested in it if you're full. However, as you were saying, and, and yes, I agree with this, um, there are some foods that are so motivating to us that they have a motivational ability that, is, that goes beyond hunger and is independent of hunger, not completely independent. I mean, there is a level of satiety where you can reach it and you're like, no, I, I'm not going to eat this no matter what. It, I'm not going to eat this molten chocolate you know, molten lava chocolate cake or whatever it's One called. One struggles to imagine. <laughs> um, yeah, there's a point. But you have to get pretty far down the satiety line. I mean, you have to be pretty stuffed to get to that point for most people to say no to dessert. But you don't have to be stuffed to say no to a boiled potato. You just have to be full. So, yeah, there, there are really important interactions between those two things. And, again, it's a continuum. It's, it's not black and white whether a food is where food's going to fall on that continuum. 